Doing all right. That's good. Right. Yeah, nice to see you. Same here. Um, I've had this microphone in a different room, so that was why I was two minutes uh, late getting set up, just so I could make sure I had it perfectly placed for you. How does that sound? It's really good. Good. How do I sound? You sound fine, except for some reason your 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 picture is freezing on me occasionally. Hopefully, it's not going to happen with the audio. Well, I haven't experienced it on my end yet, so okay. If it does, we'll figure it out, I guess. Okay, all right. Yes. It's nice to see your home office. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. It's what it is. Yeah, we're up in Athens, so just maybe about twenty two or twenty twenty three miles from where you're sitting. Yeah, I know. I think you got. I used to um, have re a bit more reason to go there. You got the Crossroads Brewery there, don't you? Closed down. Is it really? But yeah. they're still making beer, right? Yeah, it's a new operation. They just opened about a month or so ago, and they're make all they have right now is beer. Though they threatened to bring in some food eventually. So, but right now they're producing beer, so you you can go there and drink so, beer made Crossroads on the premises. But Crossroads is still going. The well, the name of the place is, I guess, changed. I can't even. I don't even. I'm not even sure what it's called. But Crossroads, okay. I don't think, is the name of. I think they they left. They're actually even re redoing the entire the building. It's really rather impressive. It's like uh, okay, restoring it back to a, a, I imagine its original state. You know, and um, yeah. So that's <laughs> we have like maybe two other restaurants. Yeah, you know. so you have choice. You have this restaurant or that restaurant. This or that, yeah. No, yeah. the other, not the other yet. Although we have this little, I guess there is a bit of a diner down by the park down there. And uh, we have the Stewart House. And yeah. I guess there's a few choices. You know, if you're desperate enough, you'll find something. Yeah. Good to see you, though. Outside Good. of the farmer's market. Outside of the farmer's market in KZE, yeah. Yeah. Right. I know you're recording already, but is this just yeah. preamble? Or is everything I just mentioned going to go on air? That's your choice. I kind of tend to let certain ones of these go in a kind of very organic direction, you know, because. Oh, I like that. I like that because I meet you at the farmer's market and buy organic food. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we'll also keep this a uh, conversation meat free. Yes. Although no you want to get to be... the meat of the matter whenever you're ready. Well done, sir. Well played. <laughs> you can you can tell what my job is, can't you? <laughs> you I might love, become I love carefully. playing with words well it's, it comes in handy and that's you you, you may already been hired for co-host from here on because uh, <laughs> hopefully that. the Although, pay scale is better than my show no and I know can what we, we got? one step beyond the, on your phone now is this uh, let's see the latest episode it says here January 4th yeah so my thought is um, these are done as like sort of on the on not to say on the fly in a negative way, but like done when they're ready to be released and not right. on a schedule. Yeah, which isn't a bad way to do it um, because sometimes it can be a bit of a headache trying to keep to a schedule. Yeah, um, it can work against your, uh, you know. It, it, it can be really hard work, but if you don't have a schedule, if you're somebody like me and you don't have deadlines, you tend to just, uh, I, I I love slipping into the second person when I'm talking about me and criticizing myself. And I, I, yeah. I default to the second person. If I find I absolutely no, I find I will not criticize them at all for doing that. <laughs> if I don't have deadlines, I tend to just overwrite, overdo things, procrastinate and not get them done. So there is there is a, a virtue to deadlines um self-imposed ones you know including you don't always meet them but if um you know i have my 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 substack which i know you subscribe to and i promise a midweek update 
and a long weekend read and if i don't get the midweek update out by thursday it doesn't feel very midweek and if i don't get the weekend up um the long read weekend long read out by sunday it definitely doesn't feel like the weekend so there is there's you know there's something to be said for deadlines it keeps you keeps you on task as long as you don't have too many of them right Right. No, and I, uh, for the mar lar for the most part, I've been, re you know, releasing my podcast on a weekly basis, which has been, wow. which, which I've certainly fallen short, um, in the, the more recently, but because I kind of have, uh, you know, I wouldn't say hit a wall, but I've, I've, you know, I just sort of decided to slow it down a little bit because I've been doing it for so many years now that, um, you know, I just, I just have to. Sure. <laughs> completely you know? completely understood yeah but but you know it's still uh, something that but i agree with you I, I you know i try to always i have it the my podcast goes out live on this other enterprise this platform called radio free rhinecliff mm -hmm. i don't know if you've been invited over there or anything but um uh, and as a matter of fact, I mean, honestly, we should have just met there and done the show together live, you know, in the studio there. But I guess we could still do that. Um, this could be like our test run in a way. Anyway, it, 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 it could be. But you know what? You've you've got me right now. Right. And, That's right. Uh, there you and, go. You know, you always you always got to just go with what you arrange. I have heard of Radio Free Ryan Cliff. I know one of the DJs on there. I mean, oh, let's be good. honest, every every village as a radio station now. I mean, anybody can do all of this and we are deluged by opportunity and options mm. in a way that, that we never have been in humanity. And as, and, you know, I surround myself with people like yourself, Adam, who, um, who do things and that is wonderful. But the downside is a lot of us are so busy doing things. We don't have time to, consume things and I do sometimes I mean obviously there's no shortage of consumers out there but I do sometimes wonder whether you know 95 percent of people are are just consumers and the other five percent of us are doing all this sort of like production but don't have time to consume each other's productions it's 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 really really hard work to do, even you know even stay up and, and in contact or in touch with my best friends writings or uh, their radio shows because I grew up in a culture where there was one, one radio station played pop music and there was one 30 minute TV show that played pop music. It was pretty easy to get your fill of pop music. Um, you know, nowadays, nowadays, just with like everybody's got an opinion and everybody's got an opportunity to to share that opinion. And I'm 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 among those people. I'm included. It, it just does leave us spoiled for choice, but sometimes really overwhelmed with choice as well. So what we're saying here is democracy is overrated. No. And, you know, dictatorship, maybe that's the way to go. Maybe, you know. <laughs> no, demo democracy is not overrated. The only good thing, because I was writing about this um, uh, literally just yesterday, I, I, it, it's something I've got to still work on. Growing up in England with only Radio 1, fortunately, Radio 1 was not, you know, we weren't quite the Soviet Union. Um, it, it, it played everything. It was AM radio. And when people talk about the golden age of AM radio, I get it because growing up on Radio 1, I heard everything. You know, it got more difficult when punk happened and there was definitely a feeling that certain music was being censored or not, not favoured. And uh, that, I mean, that, that was the truth. Uh, the, the, the BBC had a difficult time figuring that out. But um, as a kid between my formative, formative years of sort of eight and 13 before punk happened, it was just everything. You could just, you know, you would, you would literally have on the radio, like my earliest memories would be probably that I was hearing Alice Cooper alongside David Cassidy, alongside Don McLean, alongside the Spinners, alongside probably you know, the Who when they had hit singles out. Um, uh, probably Melanie was in there, all kinds of great novelty records, some of which have stood the test of time better than others. Um, reggae music, all of it, all of it. You just, you know, it was all there. And so what? that was the one advantage of having only the one station. Right. And But maybe had you been born 10 years earlier, would it have been a very different picture? Yeah, it would have been very, very different. There was no radio, uh, pop radio at all 10 years earlier. 
I mean, we've, you know, it's remarkable actually when you when you bring that to my attention. Radio One only launched in 1967. Mm. And I started listening to the radio in, in 1972. So it was still only five years old. So if I'd been born 10 years earlier, I'd have been part of um, more part of maybe um, I'm trying to think I'd have I'd have kind of started coming of age, depending when I'd have gotten into music, I'd have probably been the perfect age for the Beatles and the Stones and, and, and the Who and all of that, but probably not got to see any of them until the late 60s. So I'd have been listening to pirate radio like anybody else. Mm hmm. I learned quite a bit about this as uh, what, what you're describing in, in your book, Moon, mm -hmm. actually, because we, you know, that was such an essential, um, pla uh, you know, part of, 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 of course, the uh, evolution of any uh, band was, you know, going from sort of a small town and then that radio exposure was, was you know, going to be the defining thing for them or not. You know, mm -hmm. you either made it or you didn't. And if you made it, you were on the radio. Hearing yourself on the radio had to be like, um, you know, just unbelievable back then. I'm I'm sure it was, and I mean, I you know, I had a band as well, and I remember how excited right. we were the first time we were on, on Radio One. Um, it's you know what, it's an interesting ob, ob, uh, thing to wonder. What was the big moment for a group, you know, like the Beatles? Was it the radio or was it a TV show? Like, if there was no pop radio what was the big breakthrough for them it was probably the television and prior prior to radio one just to be uh, uh, you, you know as you say we're doing this very organically but prior to radio mm -hmm. one the bbc did have what they call the light program there were radio shows that had bands in so there are beatles sessions who sessions there's a whole bunch of sessions by the who in 65 66 before radio one that were on the bbc but there wasn't this sort of um once Radio 1 came in, I guess you had a 12, 14 hour day of, of pop music. Prior to that, it was like, here is one radio broadcaster with a very posh accent who is going to have a session by a, a band with the odd name of The Beatles. You know, it was that kind of thing. Um, let's look at this as kind of the, the prelude, this conversation, you know, and now to kind of start from you know, not to get too caught up in chronology because it's not necessarily organic all the time, but I do kind of want to know, uh, given how much of you know, being a writer as well as a musician coexist in your, in your fiber, like, I'm just wondering uh, when, how these things, did they, I mean, you know, when did they start to develop originally, but also have they kind of, uh, you know, at times maybe rubbed up against each other have they caused some friction in your you know did you feel like i gotta just sort of pick one uh, you know yeah uh, because these you know can be bifurcating and if that's a word yeah <clears throat> bifurcating is a good word to use um it was definitely a conflict there's a couple of things there um being a, a music enthusiast is not a crime so I started out, my goal was always to be in a band. I mean, um, mm -hmm. th that was my dream. That was my goal. I worked so incredibly hard on that. And I formed a band at school even before I started the fanzine at school. And I started the fanzine age 13. Yeah, I, know. I was jamming with, with our, my drummer friend, like the moment that I knew he played the drums which was when we were 11 or 12, he started like learning the drums. Um, what happened was that, that I started- You would mention the instrument you were playing because you play guitar? I play was playing guitar um, mm -hmm. and we, we, we formed a group. And when in the third or fourth year, which would be similar to like um, eighth or ninth grade, maybe seventh or eighth grade, one of um, an after punk had happened that a, a kid at school kind of went from being a very posh, swatty, kid to being like a uh, he gradually became Sid Vicious before becoming George Michael it was quite a few characters he mm -hmm. uh, he inhabited but he um he he let us know that his dad wanted him to take piano lessons but he was angling to get a bass and I'm like I think that means you're angling to be in our, our group so great we got a trio um I was only just starting out my fanzine jamming which jamming. But, but but what happened with that was 
it took off and it took off because of my hard work. So I was always like, look, I've got a band here's, you know, sort of like, here's my fanzine. And I was able to give music people in not just musicians, but people I might have met in the business. I was able to give them a copy of my fanzine long before I could give them a demo tape. And there was certainly a sense um, that uh, once I was sort of like really going with the band, well, which is it going to be? Who, you know, what are you? Are you are you doing this fanzine or are you a musician? But I wasn't, I wasn't alone in that. Many, many, many a musician has also been a music journalist, um, and there were some great names there. Lenny Kay comes to mind, but Bob Geldof wrote for the music press. Chrissy Hind wrote for the music press. Morrissey right. tried his best to write for the music press. Many, many musicians did fanzines, and obviously. I mean, Alan McGee, who ran Creation Records, also, just like me, ran a fanzine, put on gigs, had a band. And ultimately, one of these things will kind of take over your life. And Did you say, um, did you include Patti Smith when you just now? I didn't include Patti Smith, but I mean, yeah, she was. She right also was. Six. She didn't have yeah. a fanzine, of course, but she wrote music articles. I mean, she wrote yeah. for yeah a good a good sort of you know i don't like to use the word intellectual because because i i i'm not academic um and i came up through a a sort of lower middle class um environment mm -hmm. and and that's my uh you know that's where i'm at but if i can use the word sort of intellectual anybody who's got an intellectual approach to music as a musician can surely write about it. I mean, and you, to be equally clear, to do a fanzine or something, you don't need that intellectual approach. You just need to know what you're talking about. And most musicians do. But obviously where it becomes a problem is when you've got kind of a big fanzine magazine and then you're trying to tout your band, people, people start to see that the wrong way. And really what happened to me is um, every, I had so many things going on at the end of my teens that I took my eye off the band just as we were signing to EMI and um, and it all sort of just fell apart. It was like a kiss of death. And when the band broke up, um, I was just like, I can't go through this again. My, my, my best friend who I'm doing this current project, The Dear Boys with after all these years, because we stayed best friends, I had brought him into the group because I wasn't a good enough singer and I didn't trust my other bandmate to do my songs justice because he was a songwriter and there was a lot, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Of, a lot of classic band competition. But um, but my best friend was all like, well, you know, you and I are quitting our group. The group was called Apocalypse. We, we're quitting the group at the same time. Now let's do something else. I'm like, I can't. I've got I've got my magazine and I'm. it took me 10 years to get this far. <laughs> right. Yeah. Only for only for the deal with EMI to sort of have us fall apart. So that was me done, um, and it took me it took me much of my life to get back around to it again. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the, obviously, uh, you you were writing you're writing and jamming the the fanzine was the first time you 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 discovered your voice as a writer. Yeah, very, very much so. And that was that's what is remains great about fanzines. They are they are the expression of the person who puts them out. They are from you know, the word fan is is sort of that's that word's overrated in it. It's really um, there's a word people are talking a lot about perzines these days because more and more What is it called? Perzines, like personal P E R. Oh, 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 oh. Wow. I haven't heard that. And the last episode, I have a, a, a podcast called the, the Fanzine Podcast. And the last episode, we, we really like focused on this. But a perzine is just like maybe somebody writes about the books they're reading or the food they're eating, or, or maybe every episode they, they uh, not episode, sorry, every issue they put out has a different theme. But just like a music fanzine, it's an expression of self. And so, yeah, that was where I first found my voice, Adam. Yeah. Wow. So wait, is the is hold on one second now? I'm I, I'm just constantly uh, catching up. So oh, so the the it seems like the fanzine. Oh, wait, there it is, Perzine. This is actually something you, you you're doing, even. Oh, is this like monthly? Yeah, it is. It oh, is. Ira was on there. You have Ira. I just saw Ira last weekend. Um. Yeah, Ira's Ira. uh, great. I I. Um... I started doing the fanzine podcast when we put out a book of the fanzine magazine, a compendium about two years ago. 
and it was just an idea as a promotional tool. So I did 10 episodes when we talked to a lot of the people who contributed to jamming and and that was a really, really fun thing. It got me back in touch with people and then I let it uh, sit and I kept thinking, this might be good to expand this and talk to other fanzine editors. So I, I put that out monthly. And to be honest, it does better than One Step Beyond, which um, I think mm -hmm. my, my problem with One Step Beyond, I don't know if you have the same problem, is you know, I like different subjects and covering different things. And right. I think if you've got a podcast that's called The Fanzine Podcast, people know what it is. And they, I, yeah, it's so. a, it's you put your finger right on it. Um, I mean, you know, I bring on what film wax is, uh, it's, 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 it's sort of like a double edged sword. I mean, it's, it's it generally what's that? It's film and wax, right? <laughs> well, that's not how it was intended, as far as I mean, it's really supposed to be a film podcast, and 99% of the time it is, but then I always, you know. I'll just make an exception. It's my show, right? That's your show, That's the fanzine. Exactly you do whatever way you bloody well want to, but you know, for, but it's not. It's it's rarely encouraged if you're branding properly. Yeah. So you're not I branding know. properly. That's your problem. Yeah, Tony. I know. I know. It's a little <laughs> easier to do with the fanzine podcast, but hey, yeah. there you go. But um, yeah. But this is. But so you know, I sometimes think, oh, maybe I should have called called it something else. Maybe I should still just call it like the wax or something like. You know, but it's, you know, it's what, what it's, it's out there. It's been out there forever. You're um, not going to change. You're not going to change its name now. I mean, I don't think the Beatles were particularly proud of their name after a while. It <laughs> didn't do them any harm. <laughs> well said. Yeah. Um, so you, 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 was it through the fanzine in those days, I'm guessing in the seventies where you, um, had the um maybe gathered well obviously it wasn't in the 70s when you started the idea of writing your first book but um maybe late 80s or something i'm trying to guess when when yeah you, when... i was i was pretty fortunate that when my magazine folded and it did fold it it, it just had done too much running before it could walk and i didn't go to business school and um <clears throat> to be honest i, I came out of it pretty badly um, but I was very, very fortunate there was some contacts. I immediately got the opportunity to write uh -huh. a book, not just on, but with Echo and the Bunny Men. And unlike a lot of other people who music journalists or just writers who do books, I was not turned off by the experience. Um, I found that gathering up you know, more information for a bigger project was okay. And that was 87 or 88 that came out. I think 87, it may have come out. Like you're 25 years old. Yeah. Um, I think you'll find it's 35 years old. No, you were 25 is what I meant. I was 20. I would have been, sorry. Something like that. 24, 25. 23, actually. Yeah, 20, oh, okay. 23, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then a couple of years later, a year or so later, I moved to New York and... Um, Fortunately, my same publishers were really interested in doing a book about REM, even though they hadn't exploded yet. Mm -hmm. So we did that. And um, that I, then I got, uh, as happens, sidetracked a little in, in, in New York, but I was doing a lot of journalism work and some other stuff was going on. And um, I had had this idea of, for a long, long time, I mean, almost forever, I had thought, why is there not a proper book on Keith Moon? And you, 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 you know this thing. I mean, it's a well-known maxim. What is it? Axiom. It's one or the other. I'm, I'm only a writer. I don't know my words. Um, that you know, you 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 write the book that's not on your shelf. You write the book that has that needs to be written. And I was unbelievably nervous initially about the prospect of taking on somebody you know, that, that was as legendary as Keith Moon. And even for all that I'd you know, built contacts in the music world, this was going to be a big ask. But I also just kept coming back around to it and, and thinking, well, if not me, who? Um, no pun intended. No pun intended. All, but if not me, who? And, and why not me? Um, if this was somebody that I was fascinated by the who were my favorite band if I'd been fortunate enough to meet Keith right before he died and he was really, really nice. And therefore, certain aspects of his reputation couldn't be completely true. 
um, then maybe who better than me to tell the story? And I was particularly blessed because the editor I had already done these two books with happened to be, his name is Chris Charlesworth, and he always deserves a, a shout out in my life because he was a um, major melody maker journalist in the 70s and a massive Who fan and very well connected with the Who. So he was like, this project, I will go to the wall on. He was even like, if you, even if you end up taking it to another publisher, I'll do everything I can to help this book come out. Wow. Right. So um, things, you know, things worked out in that regard. But yeah, it was it was a very very big step up from, like the REM book. It now nowadays because it got updated many many a time, and mm -hmm. I finally got to, to to kind of have it look the way I wanted. But when it first came out, it was maybe sixty thousand words. 80,000 words. That's not a big book. No. And the, the Keith Moon book ended up being 600 pages. And that is a big book. So, um, that's, yeah, I read that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was an enjoyed it. Yeah. You, you read it. You read it. You seem to read it pretty quickly. And, and this does so, uh, amaze me. Well, I'm that's, sorry, uh, that's the you. thing about, that's the thing about, um, I find, uh, when you keep telling the story and you're not, I mean, the story, you kept with the story going. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not like you just kind of kept circling around one thing or you, you know, there's there's a, a whole journey and you're on it. I, I don't know. There's just a, a bit, there's a momentum in the book. So 600 pages all of a sudden does not feel, it feels long when you're about to crack it open. But once you've, you've sort of taken a bite out of, the, of, of it, it goes down pretty, pretty quickly. Yeah, I think that might, um, I, I mean, I think you did hit the nail on the head. I was totally immersed in that book. I was totally immersed in Keith's life. I I kind of dropped all other work for a year <laughs> or two, which was really scary because we had a kid during that time as well. Oh, right. And, oh, actually, no, I had a, I had a very cushy number as a consultant with RCA Records. So um, my rent was being paid. So actually that was a little bit of a lie. But when I sat down to write the book, I, I even then quit doing the work with, with RCA. So actually I was sort of on my own. It was like, talk about deadlines. It was like, well, I don't get paid anything by anybody till I get this book to the publisher. So I better wow. just work on it because I can hear no the advance. crying. <laughs> there was no advance on this. Oh, no, no, there was an advance. But what I, I mean, oh. no, there, there was an advance. But what I mean is when I'm like working on the book, unless I had put that money in the bank. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there was some money in the bank, but it's like there was no more money coming in till I finished this book. That's really what I meant. So I was mm -hmm. just inside that story. And it does, I know it does come across because I sort of dared to allow my, um, I guess my personality or my fandom or something to come through. I mean, it, it wasn't a completely dispassionate um, biography. I, I, yeah, you know, and I didn't want it to be you felt or one felt, and hopefully you did, Adam, and I think you were just saying this, that the author is you know, bringing you along on this story. He's not detached from Keith's life. He's really immersed in Keith's life. So it wasn't, there was, there was nothing more sinister than a lot of caffeine involved. Um, but there was an enormous amount of energy involved in that book. And I think that the energy probably helped bring the readers along. Um, well, in my way in, hold on a second, as I'm just trying to fix something. Do you see that's like strobing or something? Yeah, I do. Sorry about that. Sure. This part you can cut out. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you're right. There, there, there is a limit to what is. Uh, eh, and let's. Uh, it's, I got a cheap uh, thing. It's not quite a ring light, but it's like something that. Anyway, um, I was gonna say my way, of course. And even though I was also a huge Townsend fan, a big Who fan, forever. You know, one of the, early on, I learned uh, you know songs um, like you know Behind Blue Eyes on the guitar, one of the first sure. rock songs I ever learned on the guitar. And, but I didn't, you know, I didn't have some fascination around Keith Moon. My way in was the author. Your way in was what? The author? The author, you. Oh, wow. I didn't right? think because, said, but I didn't, I was just. Yeah, concerned. well, I mean, I read it because I, I was curious to know what a Tony Fletcher book is. It's the first one 
that I will have read of your book of your oeuvre. So I I, I definitely plan to uh, to uh, read a second book. Good. You know, I yeah. I am I'm very very um, I'm very happy to hear that. I mean, you certainly sort of jumped in at the deep end, but um, you know that, that's that the way to go. Is, that book is 25 years old, and it just it celebrated that actually. Mm -hmm. It celebrated that anniversary in September, but in the States, it came out in January. So it's only just had its 25th anniversary. I completely forgot about that, but we sort of celebrated it in September. Um, it's amazing that people still buy the, you know, the book still sells as though it's yeah. not, not as though it's a new book. I don't mean in those kind of numbers at all, but it still sells for, for the people who just haven't yet read it. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's considered a book that doesn't, seem to go out of fashion doesn't seem to date and you're not the only person i know who read it in the last few months and and you know treated it as though it was something that was new it's great do, do you get a lot of people over the years who who interview you about the book but haven't read it um no i i wouldn't love That's to good. do that at this point i mean i probably do because i do some sort of general interviews there might be somebody that's well, interviewing sure. me about me in general i can't expect them to have read everything no. but if right. anybody who's going to come to me about the keith moon book i really hope they've read it or at least read sure. the whole book. it's but i and i only mentioned it because um you know i've had on so many people on my podcast and it's all interview as you know and um uh, i mean i it, i i surprised by how many people will have asked at the beginning fortunately it's not it's not once we've been talking for a while but they'll they'll ask me um you know have you seen the film and which is a by the way somewhat shorter commitment than, yes than a 600 page biography but um and, and just what it does is it tells me how many people are for whatever the reasons i don't know you know me uh, a lot of people have, a, have to just produce information you know, whatever article, but it's, it's just, to me, it's astounding that, 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 that happens as much as it does, where a lot of these people they, they run into, obviously, um, haven't read or seen their film. Well, if you're an entertainment or... <clears throat> journalist, for example, you know, you've probably got a lot of those deadlines to meet and they, those deadlines don't give oh, you absolutely. The time to dive, to dive deep into things. I think that that's the, the problem that always has been a, a problem. And I'm full of admiration for people who are really, really, um, well prepared. For some reason, I was thinking earlier today of uh, Brian Lira at uh, WNYC, uh, sure. who's just a great news journalist. And he is just like, I was just thinking all day long, he must just study, you know, he's got to learn what's going on. And then he's got to work on ideas with his producers. And, you know, and then he's got to study because every time he ever speaks to anybody, he knows what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. And man, what a, you know, what a full time job, but he doesn't give him much time to just go, maybe I should can go check out a movie tonight. <laughs> you know? It's true. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right for all the uh, whether it's fresh air or any of these uh, shows, which especially bring on as many authors as they do, you know, um, you got to have really good producers. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, um, yeah, I mean, my my producer, I had to let go. <laughs> they, weren't. they refused to read their your Keith Moon book. So yeah. they, and just for <laughs> then I got the pleasure of reading it anyway. So but they the um so but they the the UK version has had a slightly different title. Is that what I'm to gather? Yeah, it's the same book. You didn't write UK, two books. In the UK it was called Dear Boy. Yeah. The life of uh, the life of Keith Moon. And the American publishers balked at that title, which did the Dear Boy is like that's what Keith would say to people all the time dear boy you know, oh yeah, yeah brandy's all around dear boy you know that kind i of wasn't thing. aware about how many films he had been in uh yeah he was in a few and he really 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 Good had act. potential as yeah. an actor uh -huh. um it's unfortunate that that he wasn't able to see that through further um and certainly his um his lifestyle and addictions you know really got in the way of that but when he was good he was great um the yeah the difficulty is you know he was never going to be much more than being typecast um as you know for for certain roles but i mean he he yeah if he could have gotten sober earlier in life or at right. least halfway sober he could have been a great actor but moving to um 
Los Angeles in the mid 70s, even with aspirations of doing movies, was not a good move for anybody who was thinking about getting sober. Right. Yeah, in that day and age, uh, being not around in that, not in, in that day yeah. and age of the Hollywood vampires and then uh, all that, all yeah, that, yeah. Not at all. But we know, and what I really appreciate about the book, we see the extent of his, um, his mental, his mental illness. Can we call it that? In a, using a broad term, um, he certainly suffered from, you know, uh, a lot. Uh, I, I assume, you know, um, um, maybe depression certainly so much insecurity and self-doubt and yeah. and self-medicated largely undiagnosed i mean he was diagnosed right at a certain point no you, no, you, no, you I mean, just no, never properly he, diagnosed no he wasn't um which leaves you know a lot of uh, an awful lot of unanswered questions uh, yeah certainly there's no absolutely no question that he was hyperactive that's that part can't be possibly be denied you know he but here is the here is the incredible irony and um you know it's one that applies to a lot of other things going on in the world as 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 we on one hand we do the right thing and doing the right thing is diagnosing our kids and acknowledging mental uh, mental health issues and this mm -hmm. goes for sports stars it goes for musicians musicians are able to cancel tours now with um, a lot easier than they used to uh, you know they can they can say they're exhausted they can talk about mental health issues and and the pressure etc and what i'm getting at here is that um keith grew up and i grew up in a society that did not um diagnose there were no therapists there was no therapy there was there was just none there was none there was no you were either considered mental meaning mad Got or, it. or you sort of weren't. I mean, if you had a kid at school who acted a bit mental, you were just like, well, that kid's mental. But nobody was diagnosing that kid. And they, so, so the, the irony I wanted to get to there is that if Keith was born today in, in, in a similar, you know, if music was happening the same way, he would have been diagnosed at a young age as ADHD because he was. He'd have been loaded up with Ritalin and he'd never have turned to the drums. And there would have been no Keith Moon that we know of and loved. He would probably have just gone through life medicated uh, in a, sorry, he, what he did, as you pointed out, self-medicate, but he'd have gone through life on, you know, like, like being tamped down. So it's just one of these, um, it's just one of these things that, that, that Keith's, you know, Keith would have benefited from more professional mental health care, but the world would have lost Keith Moon under who? Well, there are a lot of, um, I'm, this is me guessing, but I, I mean, I, you know, pretty, pretty, I think I'm probably right that there's quite a lot of um, diagnosed, uh, well, uh, artists out there, musical or music artists who have various types of, um, I don't know, you yeah. know, uh, mental, mental illness is a very, very broad, broad term, but are yeah. medicating properly or, you know, um, under care so that, you know, they're prescribed prescribed Absolutely. Uh, but I'm going back. work I'm... successfully so i think maybe 30 years ago but it's maybe... even more than that Once... it's, a lot, it's a lot more than that adam keith would oh. have been pushing 80 so what we're talking no no, no i know i'm saying yeah. but I, I would just to finish my I, I i recognize exactly especially in the uk i think the u.s probably came around to to um less you know like uh, De decreasing the the level of stigma associated with these issues you know before maybe the uk possibly there were more doctors it's a much larger country i mean this mm -hmm. you know science research here for whatever reason was um happening sooner and faster and so people got probably more help sooner also though there was this long period of you know of experimentation during the i would say primarily late 70s into the 90s of people being over medicated mm -hmm. uh, uh because all of a sudden this was stopping the chaos pop but but there were these people walking around like zombies or at least like you're saying um you know maybe there was a bit of a pendulum swing so now it feels like we're far more further along and maybe if Keith was alive or recently more recently born, perhaps he would still be able to be a drummer, but certainly that was his prescription before the booze and the pills. The yeah. drumming was one way to work out all of that uh, unbridled tension or uh, energy that he had. Yeah. Um, I mean, thank God for them. But of course he didn't stop yeah. there, you know? 
Yeah. But it's a brilliant, brilliant book and very pat compassionate, I'd say, um, um, portrait of, of Keith Moon. Um, glad I had the opportunity to get to know him. And I'm wondering, you know, you, you talked to how Im you immersed you were, weren't doing very much else during that period of time. It shows in the book, but I'm wondering just like what that experience is like where this person becomes a real human being to you, um, but you can't put your arms around him or you can't go for, you know, like buy him a uh, coffee, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, I mean, funny funny enough, the, um, the point that I really let that come out in the book was when a, a point that I think we wanted to punch him. Um, you just want there, and it, it, it related specifically to his father-in-law try um actually i think oh yeah trying to get after him for one of his many digressions or transgressions and i think i said something like you know you i mean either who can blame him or we, we wish he could that was that was tough because i the deeper in that i got i realized that keith's demons were very real they were always there and as is you know you know that old saying uh, you know, never get close to your heroes there was um, there was a lot in Keith's behavior that was sort of unforgivable and not excusable and not down to ADHD. And I'm talking particularly about his treatment of his wife. Um, but yeah, it is it is it is hard. I was in very, very, very deep in the book. I remember I was having a very hard time sleeping and mm -hmm. um, uh, I was in too deep. I mean, I found myself sort of weirdly adopting all these little habits of of that, that I was writing about. Um, and again, I don't mean like, you know, the, 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 the really worst ones. I couldn't have written that book if I'd become a, you know, some kind of alcoholic. That wasn't going to happen. But um, I, it was quite a difficult experience. And I wasn't desperately keen to repeat that. I wasn't desperately keen to get so immersed in somebody's life again that you were wake. You know, I was going to bed you know, feeling like Keith Moon and waking up feeling like Keith Moon for a couple of years. Um, and I'm not trying to say in any ways like I was waking up, you know, with his depression or his particular alcoholism, his issues. I'm saying that he was in my head, like my head was becoming Keith Moon's head because I was so immersed in this book that that I was just going to sleep, like thinking about Keith, waking up, thinking about Keith. And some of that's very entertaining. The music's fantastic. Um, some of it's really, really comical, but some of it was was not. And as I got deeper into the story and wrote more and more of the book, it's like, I don't like this person who's bringing me, com accompanying me to bed. You know, he's just done something really crappy. Um, but I had to end my writing there. Now I've got to go to bed with the fact that I'm writing this book about a childhood hero who behaved badly but not not just in the comical way you know was was and abusive and, could be and, abusive yeah and as you say somebody that i wanted to put my arm around you know somebody that you felt really sorry for i felt really sorry for at the same time it's like man i'm having to i'm having to like dig deep into this guy's life and it's it's worse than i thought it, it, were you worried about your own state of mental health at the time is that what you're saying were there um, moments I, I, it was a dark, it was quite a dark place to be in. Mm. And, and um, I think what, I mean, it it was, and that's partly because I was doing these sort of 16 hour days of writing. Mm -hmm. um, there were two periods with the book. And I said, we had a baby, which meant at that point, my wife wasn't working. And there were two periods where she went off to her mother's, you know, to the in-laws. Um, but not not because like we had a row, but it was just like, I was just like, I think you should probably just like, it's this summer. Is, right. do, you do you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be much of a husband and, and, and dad. And um, yeah. I'm just trying to think. My kid was, my baby was two years old by that point. It's not yeah. like he was born the, you know, the day before I started writing the book. So so certainly I was surrounded. You, know, by, you, you, you had the terrible twos. I had a nice one, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's yeah. what was that's what was going on. Um yeah. It, 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 I, I will say since then, I've, I've kind of created a rule. And I think some of this is just with aging. 
um, because it would be true of musicians. There's a limit to how many good hours you can put in on a given day on a, on one project. Um, you know, when you're when I was 17, eight, when I was 17, um, my band did like 33 hours in the studio out of 48 hours um, because you could because you had the energy and and that book was probably the last time I was able to just push through push through just get up work 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 and since then I've been much more about it's an eight hour day and then you you go clear your head yeah and uh, when writing a book and even eight hours is more than enough sounds like it um uh two things I want to get to before as yeah. you know in the last in this last um bit as you might say in the UK um I want to talk about a little bit more about the Substack, mm -hmm. and I want to also talk about make sure we talk about the Rock Academy and your work sure, with, that's with great. the Rock Appreciate Academy and Woodstock. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, I want to know in terms of just like your Substack, is, are you do you have a um, something of like a writer's mission for, with it? Is there something you're trying to achieve overall uh, with it, or is it just kind of much looser and whatever is on your mind? Um, well, there are a couple of things I'm trying to achieve. I am, I've, I've come to terms with the fact that um, if, if you ask me to like describe myself in just one word, I don't know the writer would do it because I've done a lot of different things. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I think it's like, I, I, I have this, this innate need to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, and that so that communication can come through you know broadcasting, doing a podcast, DJing. It can be through organising. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I've tended to be known as you know somebody who gets people together, and so I I was just running into this thing that a lot of us have run into. Where so so actually going going back a long way back in two thousand, I set up my own website for that same sort of need. Um, I think I foresaw the early days of blogging um, and was on there doing that before it was called blogging. And it came, it was the same thing. It was like this sort of ridiculous ego that um, that's, that that thinks that people care what I have to say, um, which is what, you know, fanzine writers start out doing. It's like you publish a fanzine because you think I have an opinion and I want to share it. Um, and And that's what fanzine writers do. It's also what musicians do. And mm -hmm. in more recent years, I've just become so fed up with social media that, you know, you get up in the morning, you say, I've got something valid to say, and you put it on Facebook. And Facebook has its own algorithms. Nobody gets to see it because it's too right. long. It doesn't have a picture of a cat. Um, you know, it doesn't have a picture of, of a person. I've, I've yeah. long ago figured out that if you want your Facebook or Instagram post to be seen, you put a face on it. That's why it's called Facebook, I guess. You know, that's, that's, that's what you do. There you go. So it's a need. It's a need to write. It's a desire to write. Um, and as much as anything, you know, um, what pl platforms like Substack offer, and it's it is really important, is it's email driven. It's subscriber driven. You can just go on there. It's tonyfletcher.substack.com. I love that it looks like a magazine website. It looks like the New York Times almost. You know, it, it looks really good on the front page. Well designed. Everybody's, got, everybody's not just mine. It's how they have it designed. Um, but if you subscribe, and, and that's obviously what all of us want people to do, you actually get these posts in your inbox. So somebody who subscribes is basically saying, yeah, I like what this person writes. And I'm happy to get 500 words from them three times a week or 2000 words once a week, mm -hmm. because they've got something valid to say, and I value that. And then ideally, you place you do get to place a financial value on it. And um, everybody, you know, everybody on Substack is fighting for the very, very same very small piece of pie, which is, you know, how many people have how many $5 a month to spend on somebody on Substack. But you know, you try and build that up because you want to be a writer. And the, the, the bottom fell out of the freelance game quite a while back between, you know, the internet, the collapse of um, old media and new media is thriving in many ways. But the field for good writing um, is very small. It used to be bigger and it doesn't pay as well as it used to. So I'm not the only person sort of at my age. Indeed, there's lots of people in their 20s doing this. Um, mm -hmm. I put out two posts a week. I do a midweek update that's like a, a usually a lot of recommendations, but based on my own taste and what I've been doing, like 
last night I went to see the Lee Perry movie at the Orpheum in Saugerties and today mm-hmm. I wrote about it and that'll be up probably tomorrow as part of a midweek update and then the weekend I do a longer article sometimes I go into the archives so I put up interviews from the Keith Moon book with Oliver Reed Jeff Beck Alice Cooper um, I'm working on the, the John Entwistle one right now because it's pretty which one John Entwistle oh Entwistle of course yeah mm-hmm. yeah and sometimes I write about the other week I wrote about, you know, I realized that um, I've been thinking this for a long time. You know, I know what the best gig of the 21st century was for me. And it was something I wanted to write about. It, it, you know, that opinion hasn't changed. Um, and people like the personal touch, I think. You know, it, it, most writers on Substack, it's like a fanzine. You get their personality, not just their taste, but you sort of, you know, you want them to you use a lot of first person in a way that maybe when I was writing for music papers and particularly when I was writing for say Newsday back in the 90s the first person was to be kept out unless they asked you to write a first person article so it's a different form of writing that's much more like the old fanzine um but I think it's up to all you know every writer to just do the very best they can particularly if they if they're hitting people up and saying hey do you want to do you want to upgrade to a paid subscription and actually help me justify this thing <laughs> yeah um i understand the I have a, the patreon model for the podcasting and but i largely you know i don't spend too much time and energy on on that part of it anymore no, I, just, I, you know. I don't um I don't at all. And I've I, mm-hmm. see one thing is I'm I'm really resistant to taking advertising um, because the ads are just crap. I mean, if yeah. I could get um, right. if I could get a great sponsor for any any show, I would take that because if there was a sponsor I believed in, I would just tell people, hey, I believe in this. But I, mm-hmm. I do know people who have sponsors when I hear them sh- shill, you know, do the, 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 the spiel. I'm like, you don't believe this. You know, and, and I don't want to be uh, sponsored by a bank or a credit card or and I, I, I hate all these ads that pop up on, on podcasts that are just the cheapest, worst kind of ads. So the podcasting, I think I have to treat it's as falling out. The, I, I, I hear it's kind of, um, you know, falling the bottoms falling out of that anyway, because uh, people have discovered this, uh, you know, option to move 15 forward seconds. 15, 15 seconds, seconds and things. Yeah. And so. They're just not, yeah, it's a very, it, uh, advertising is going to get harder and harder anyway. So, yeah. Um, okay. So to, to, was something I really know the least now about is your relationship with the Rock Academy in Woodstock. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, well, I, well, and your role there. Yeah, this has been such a wonderful thing in my, the last five years of my life. Um, I don't mean I'm about to die. I realize how that just sounded. <laughs> Over the last well, five Well, why years. did I bother inviting you on here then? Tell me what the... <laughs> I thought for sure this was getting I, the last... I, I hate to tell you if I thought I was about to go, I might have other priorities. But oh. uh, don't take that personally. Um, in the last five years of my life, I, the, the most recent five years of my life, yeah. I have been heavily involved with the Rock Academy that is based in this is the Woodstock Saugerties border. Um, right. It's a particularly there's a lot of schools of rock and rock academies around these days, um, oh. and and I'm endlessly fascinated by how society changes and we change. And I was talking about Keith um, with being mm-hmm. Ritalin these days. I, there were no guitar teachers when I grew up in London. It, it, it's amazing. Every guitarist was self-taught. Um, and, you, you know, you learned from a friend and you learned from records and you bought a book and you did your best. Um, the world has changed. And, and, and instead of me having to, like, hustle for gigs where my band was underage, you know, kids these days, uh, as young as eight, can join our rock academy. And um, what we do there is, in a nutshell, the, the, there are five seasons, no, sorry, there are five shows per season and there are three seasons per year. And the each show is a tribute of some kind. It's not original music. Um, it's a tribute of some kind. Um, and this, this, there's two sets. It's usually about 24 songs total, which is a lot. And you get given a cast as I'm a director there. And I get given a cast of anywhere from 20 to 30 students, uh, ranging from absolute beginners to really, really good 17-year-olds who are going off to a music college. Um, And 
they rotate in and out of different songs um, they, a lot of them rotate instruments because we recommend they learn as much as possible. The Rock Academy also teaches individually. So mm -hmm. some people might say, look, I've got a guitar teacher. That's why I joined. Or I've learned piano. That's why I joined. But um, we, we teach and I've done teaching there as well. And we take these shows. So the boss, Jason Bowman, who has been running it for 10 years, initially with Paul Green, and Paul Green was the model for Jack Black in School of Rock. Okay. So we have a slightly higher profile than most of these other rock academies around the country um, because, because of that of the association. association. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and, and, it, and it's a valid one. And of course, being in Woodstock, there's, there's a lot of good music talent growing up there. Um, but you know, I t I'll take a cast, all of us take a cast, and Jason puts together the initial cast list and the initial set list. The set list doesn't change, but my cast list will come in with a lot of blanks and a lot of room for new kids to sign up. And as the rehearsals go on, you start filling in these blanks with kids who are getting competent on their songs. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, that there is a thrill from taking a show that might start out in early rehearsals, like a complete train wreck. And just knowing you have like these 10 weeks that that you will turn this into something that we will sell tickets for maybe at the Woodstock Playhouse, um, at the local in Saugerties. Um, mm -hmm. we do, we do, we've done some nice venues and, and a, a big variety of venues, and we sell the tickets, and it's worth the money. Um, just this last weekend, like literally four, four nights ago, I was at um, the Woodstock Playhouse for our best of season. So all five shows got five songs each, and for the kids, it's a party. There's, there's, over, a, there's over 100 students now, so they are like half the audience um, and and it's mad and it's wonderful and it's been um, as, as much it's been a community for me there's a there's a couple of there's a couple of just utter joys I I approached Jason about it because my son was in the Rock Academy my younger son Noel who you've met um, mm -hmm. who's, yeah a really good musician he was in it and when Paul Green left um, and went back to Philadelphia I'm like well they're going to be a director down I was just starting sort of that elements of a new life. I was going through divorce and and I, I, I wanted to do some new things. I really, really did. I wasn't ready to write another big, big, big book. And so I approached Jason and he told me, well, you know, have you done anything like this before? And I just gave him my resume. He knew me and he's like, well, you're gonna have to shadow me um, and you probably won't make it because that's how it works. But what I discovered I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea that I could work with kids. I mean, they say don't work with kids and animals. I I just love these kids. And That's the great. remarkable thing is, they you know, as far as I can gather from the kids and the parents, they have a great time as well. And I've kind of come out of this with a double community because I've got these, what I would call some friendships with kids. You know, I, mm -hmm. I think of them as young young adults and I speak to them like they're on my level, you don't talk we are allowed to swear right. in the rehearsal room, you know, we, we're not, we're not like beholden to the bureaucracy of the public school system, the state school system. And additionally, some of these parents have become like my really, really close friends and, and not surprisingly, a few of them are musicians themselves. Right. So it's been a whole new community and I'm so proud of what we do. Some of every now and then you just put on these, these, these shows where a few songs will be like, they will just, they will just kill people, you know? Yeah. Amazing the talent from the kids. I gotta go. I gotta. I gotta get tickets next time. I don't know what. I gotta go. I gotta attend one of these shows. Yeah, you. You really should. You know? The best of the season we just did was was I great understand. because it it was mad because you, the five shows were Bad Brains and Carol King, and oh wow. Prog Rock and wow. British Invasion. Okay. And Joe Jackson versus Elvis Costello, and. <laughs> And and the nice thing about the best of season is Jason puts uh -huh. up the set list like 15 minutes before showtime and the audience doesn't know what it is. So you're bouncing around from a Carol King song to a Bad Brain song. You know, it's it's a it's it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, and it's sounds very, like it. very, very good. And if you have local listeners or I would just say in general, you know, I have no doubt whatsoever um, if what, I was obsessed with pop music when I was eight. And I would have joined a ro local rock academy in South London in a heartbeat. And I probably would have had some more of the tutoring on the instruments I wanted to play 
whereas I was stuck with sort of the cello and school orchestras. You know, I would have jumped at this. I really, really would have done. Well, thanks for sharing and um, that, and I'll, I'll, you know, put links up everywhere and, you know, to, to uh, not only to the rock Academy, but to your sub stack to where people can find your work, your website and everything. Um, I feel like I've gotten to know you a lot better and um, thanks for, you know, sharing so much. Yeah. And you know, what? Right. I was thinking, I was thinking this is like a good um, little moral slash life lesson to go out on. The only yes. reason we really know each other is um, you mm-hmm. were at the outdoor farm stand in Kingston, you know, doing the farmer's market. And I noticed that you had a habit of playing music right? At the, at, at the market. I think one week I just said like, this is cool. What is this? something like that or or i said oh you're playing pixies or something like you're playing mm-hmm. a band that i know and i just i'm as i think listeners can tell relatively talkative <laughs> and so i reached out to you and then i think the next week you're like well what are you listening to and it took yeah. us about a year before before i kind of let on that i had any life in music but it it just says something about being sociable talking to somebody just just you know touching base just being like hey Hey, I know that song you're playing, and and here we are, a year or two down the line, and we know each other that much better now, and, and right. we shared so much music taste together. Yeah, you're right, and um, it is. It always has been a, uh, uh, you know, a way for people just to break the ice. You know, I mean, it, well, it gives you certainly um, a uh, a clue into somebody, you know. And in most of the time, it's correct. <laughs> Not a saying all the yeah. time, but if somebody's playing some music, and it's you know, it was originally a way to drown out the banjo guy. I'll admit, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my, fair enough. <laughs> the pair, my partner down, it was going crazy. But by the way, we moved, and it just it was always something that I really just love because you can really enjoy it during that. There's something about the whole experience of being outside of of the social aspect of it which is really the reason i do it Absolutely. I, I know it might be uh shocking to know it's not the pay but and you know um i realize you know my my girlfriend wants more weekends uh you know so we can do things together and not get it interrupted because really it's most of my day i finish mm-hmm. you know even if i finish at one or two i i'm tired you know, yeah, I come course, back it, and it's a lot of work and getting up early. But so, you know, I may take a few more weekends off, but I do it mostly because I, I thought of not doing it. I thought of maybe I'll step away from it. I don't need to do it. But um, and then I realized after that, I, I kind of turned that page. I thought, I think I really would miss it. I, I think yeah. I just love, love some of those days and all the inter- surprises in the interaction be you know so and then you end up making a friend and i i you know when i moved up here you're you've been in the area a little longer than i have and i moved up from the city in 2020 uh and i you know didn't don't have my own friends i have like slowly beginning to fortunately i have a partner who has good taste in friends so i've adopted you know i'm like by by you know osmosis or what have you i have some like a social a pretty good social life but most of the people i know are down in the city so you know it's nice to uh get to know people and that's one way to meet people is just it it, it is and 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 i think that you know technology like zoom is wonderful mm-hmm. i yeah i occasionally have these calls with my friends school mm-hmm. friends i'm still right. got my school friends in australia and yeah britain and it's great to be in these like different continents but there is no substitute for just being out and about and meeting people and interacting on a not entirely random. You know, you choose to go to the farmer's market, but it's like it's interaction. We, we, we're right. social. We're social animals. We yeah, are. We know, are. And we need to remember that. Right. And I just so you know, you come by, maybe we have five minutes. There's a there's a little bit of a draw, a fall, like, you know, a little bit of a, a sadness once you walk away. Ah, oh. ah. Oh. That's very sweet. <laughs> but, but then the next, you know, somebody else comes along. But I do value your, your, uh, you know, um, your appearances a lot. It's fun to see you and to talk about oh, whatever is on our mind in those brief minutes, you know. Anyway, yeah. uh, we said an hour. We're a yeah. little over, but I think we That's did pretty cool. well. 
That's I think we cool. did pretty Thank well. Thank you so much for having me on 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 the show, Adam. And I'm happy to do it, and I'm delighted. You know, again, from talking to you, I found out all the other things that you do. So, um, yeah. very happy to be on this, and I will see you soon enough. Yeah, for sure. All right. Hopefully, the spring will get here. You know, faster than. It'll get here. A little cold at the moment, but I'm I'm cool with it. Blue skies are fine. Blue, like cold weather, exactly. It's fine if it's blue skies. Exactly. Got no argument with that. Right. Not having grown the, up in the UK, you know. I always say my favorite thing about the winter is the next season isn't the winter. You know, you it's, a, it's the best. <laughs> there you go. So, enjoy the evening. Thank you. You too, Adam. Take care. And I'll see you soon. For having me on. Bye bye. <laughs> bye.